Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back for the second in our series of talks in this year's Breakthrough Series. As always, want to thank Howard Weeder and the Canada Excellence Research Chair for underwriting this series and also welcome our simulcast guests who are, uh, are watching live today and those that are watching uh, tape delayed uh, tomorrow and, and through the rest of the week. And today it's a great pleasure to, to welcome a, a friend and colleague, Samporno Brunzil. Uh, Samporno is at the Free University in Amsterdam and also a visiting research fellow, senior research fellow at King's College in uh, London. Uh, Samporno's research interests are really on land use change, particularly in the tropics as it relates to erosion, sedimentation, and uh, nutrient cycling. And over the last 40 years, he's worked uh, in the field more extensively than really anyone in this, this research area. In uh, Southeast Asia, the Himalaya, uh, the Caribbean, various islands in the, in the Pacific, and throughout uh, Latin America. Um, he's written several definitive works. There's a 1990 UNESCO, um, UNESCO review on this topic. If you go onto Google Scholar, it's been cited well over 700 times. This has really influenced the field in a synthetic way. Also a paper he had in agricultural uh, ecosystems and environments, similar uh, number of citations really affected uh, the field through these kind of monographs and, and his, his papers in the primary literature. He's also been very active in producing documentaries. There's one that was funded by a uh, British overseas development uh, agency called Mountains in the Mist or Forests in the Mist, focused on his work in Costa Rica. That's really had a, a wide uptake. And for this, he's been made a fellow of the Amsterdam Institute uh, for International Development. He's a winner of the Busk Medal from the UK Royal Geographical Society for uh, impacts on tropical forest hydrology. He's on the editorial board of the Journal of Tropical Ecology, Hydrological Processes, Eco-Hydrology, and was an associate editor for the Encyclopedia of Forest Science. And uh, Samporno is really the most cited tropical forest hydrologist and made uh, very deep impacts over this 40-year career, and it's a pleasure to have him uh, here with us today. So, Samporno. Thank you for this warm welcome. Uh, it's been really nice being out here in uh, Saskaboom uh, <laughs> the last two days, and particularly makes for a nice change because in Amsterdam, my line of work was uh, terminated two weeks ago, so um, to feel so welcome is, is really heartening. Um, at the same time, I invite you to, let's say, judge for yourself whether this sort of work is relevant or not, um, listening to my talk. You'll see that um, I deviate from the breakthrough general title, um, and I'll show you why uh, in a minute. But I'd like to focus on the hydrological impacts of deforestation and reforestation in the tropics, um, contrasting what you might call traditional or layman views and what others consider uh, to be the scientific view. It doesn't seem to... Ah, okay. So, uh, breakthroughs in a Dutch connotation is is a very dangerous thing, you know? Uh, dikes breaking through, etc. I was born five and a half years, five and a half meters below sea level, and um, you can imagine what's happened if, if you're thinking of a breakthrough. So that's why I didn't use that in the title, although I'll be uh, referring to breakthroughs every now and then in the talk. Now, generally, you can ask a lot of questions about um, forest and water. Uh, particularly things like, do forests increase rainfall? Do they increase water production? Do they uh, prevent flooding or landsliding? All these kind of things. And generally, if, if you ask the non-scientist, people would answer yes in all, all of these cases. Whereas if you ask a scientist, he would say, or she, uh, it depends, or even no. So there's this discrepancy between the layman's view and the so-called scientific view. And I'll focus on, on three of these aspects, notably what forests do to flooding and the water production, particularly during the dry season, so-called base flows. So 
Um, as I said, there, there is a discrepancy between these two perceptions of the, the role of forests. But in the last decade or so, there have been a number of very uh, influential publications, both by FEO, but also by individuals, that are sort of bashing forests by emphasizing uh, very high water use of uh, trees and forests and downplaying or even ignoring other aspects that forests also um, bring, like better soil uh, hydrological functioning in terms of infiltration or protecting against erosion. The other thing in the debate is that people tend to talk about forests as a general category, but in terms of hydrology, it matters a lot whether you're discussing old growth forest that is in balance, in equilibrium, or whether you're talking about rapidly growing secondary forest or even exotic plantations or, or invaders. So you might well say um, not all forests are equal. You need, really need to specify what sort of vegetation you're talking about. And perhaps the most important um, part of my talk is that I stress time and again the role of soil degradation being underrated in our paradigms and in our general thinking, whereas in practice, soil degradation comes into play a lot. Now, before looking at the data, I'd like to uh, quote my favorite researcher, apart from Jeff McDonald, and that's <coughs> Sherlock Holmes. And one of my favorite quotations is that it's a capital mistake to theorize before you have data because insensibly one is led to twist the facts to suit your theory instead of the other way around. Of course, this is a bit of a, a fun slide, but there's a, a ring of truth in there, and I'll refer to that every now and, and then. So, turning to forests and floods, basically the um, debate can be summarized as it's an act of God, you know, um, maybe it's a bit of an unfortunate slide to use a, a Catholic uh, cemetery to illustrate an act of God. But on the other hand, there's also the people that believe that land use has, uh, has an impact. So it's these two, uh, two things. The traditional view has it that if we have a, a good forest cover, we'll have very high infiltration. That is, all of the rainfall will be able to be absorbed by the soil and through root channels and, and macropores, you know, these large uh, pores by burrows and, and so on, um, allow the water to infiltrate quite deeply, quite rapidly. And at the same time, this forest sponge is capable of retaining much of this water and then releasing it slowly during the subsequent dry season. But this so-called sponge theory has been criticized a lot on the basis of, um, let's say, recent work. At the same time, if you look at um, experiments using blue dye uh, liquid that you can apply onto the soil surface and then you see how that water infiltrates into the soil and you cut up the soil profile to see where the blue dye went and you compare um, what you might call closed canopy forest with lots of biological activity and dead land where biological activity has ceased like in this case in, in Madagascar you'll see that under the closed canopy situation, there is what you might call preferential flow. The blue dye infiltrates according to certain channels or pathways, whereas in the area where we have very little, um, let's say, biotic activity and very few macropores, it's more of a, a diffuse kind of infiltration. So this is sort of illustrating the sponge theory uh, under forest. At the same time, um, people have attributed magic properties to this forest sponge as if it were such that you, know, you would never have any floods as long as you have a, a decent forest. And obviously, that's not true. Wherever you go um, in the tropics, you'll see the signs of uh, past flooding, for instance, after hurricanes and, and those kind of things. And even at the small scale, like in this particular example from Bolivia, in a fairly small catchment, you can have sudden cloud bursts capable of moving rocks and trees just like that, even though you have a, a full forest cover. So um, it is clear that the forest sponge is not, you know, almighty, you might say. It has a limit, and once saturated, 
the water will pass through anyway, regardless whether you have forest or not. Well, as to the general way of thinking uh, as to the role of forest versus non-forest, um, as long as the soils are not degraded or compacted, we typically have a situation where um, this here is a diagram showing the, the size of the rainfall amount, the rainfall amount versus the response to the, um, to the rainfall. And we'll see that for relatively small storms, there's quite a bit of a difference between the forested situation and a non-forested situation, such that under forest situation, there will be less response than under non-forest. That has to do with the fact that a forest soil has more storage capacity uh, because of all the organic matter and, and that sort of thing. And so there will be less of a response. But as the amount of rain increases relative to the amount of capacity, or you could say relative to the capacity of the soil to absorb, you'll see that the effect will become less such that for the very largest events, when the soil will be saturated anyway, regardless whether we have forest or grassland, the response will be more or less the same. And that's been brought out by many temperate zone um, paired catchment experiments. So that's the general way of thinking. Uh, for these mega events, it doesn't matter much whether we have forest or not. But I would say that if we bring in soil degradation, in other words, we have surface disturbance in the sense of um, compaction or crusting or those kind of things, and it becomes a lot more important what's happening at that surface. So infiltration capacity kicks in, and it's no longer just storage capacity of the, uh, of the soil. And so, for instance, if you look at various perturbations of the surface, going clockwise, for instance, you can have soil crusting. Typically, 30 to 40% 30 to 40 of the rainfall just runs off like that and doesn't enter into the soil. If you have repeated burning with organic matter disappearing, um, biological activity disappearing, it can be up to 60, 70 percent even of the rainfall, not entering the soil but just running off along the surface. And obviously, if you have metalled or dirt roads, um, again, very poor infiltration. So that's what's happening, maybe happening on the slopes. If you turn that to, let's say, peak flow production in streams, then again we see a very strong contrast between situations with very little soil development or you could say disturbed um, surface or you know, a benign situation with um, good infiltration. And this particular graph, for instance, shows the peak flows as a function of return period. And that means that uh, you could have um, a peak flow occurring maybe once every year or every 10 years. And obviously, if it happens every 10 years, it'll be a lot bigger than when it happens every year or every two years. And the interesting thing we see here is that the peak flow return period relationship for the degraded land is a lot steeper than that for the forested land. In other words, the really mega events, the, the largest events possible, produce a much greater effect in the case of degradation than in the case of uh, a forest. So again, the impervious surface, uh, the disturbed surface, uh, produces a much greater response. So rather than the two lines converging, as we saw in the previous case of non-disturbed soil, we see that the two lines are actually diverging. And the effect is getting worse as the rainfall increases. Then there's another aspect, and that has to do with the fact that once the forest has disappeared and the root system that used to anchor the slopes um, is rotting away, or decaying rather, um, we'll see that the, in, um, the presence or the frequency of shallow landsliding greatly increases. So if you're flying over places like Taiwan or the Andes or uh, the Philippines, everywhere you see these shallow landslides after uh, heavy rainfall, particularly after hurricanes and, and, and the like. And it has a, a double effect. On the one hand, in the center of these landslides, you know, where, where the slip surface, if you like, as, um, is exposed, these become hotspots 
where the runoff runs straight along the surface to the stream, carrying you know, both water and, and sediment. But also, the soil itself is washed down in the form of these landslides, and therefore, the former sponge uh, is also disappearing. So you're actually losing the whole soil profile in these landscapes. And um, I've been working in areas in the Philippines where this happens a lot. And if you look at um, a situation like here in this grassland with all these landslides, um, you'll see that a significant portion of the stream flow during storms is actually uh, consisting of what people call new water. In other words, that's rain falling onto the catchment and immediately being discharged out of the catchment. Whereas under a forested situation where you don't have all these landslides and you don't have all these hot spots of overland flow, this would be roughly half. So under a forested situation, much more water would um, um, infiltrate and therefore the area would be less responsive. Now, this particular catchment was subjected to uh, a typhoon, a hurricane, uh, last November. And again, the difference uh, remained more or less the same during uh, this particularly large event. And we'll put the full presentation on the internet, which contains a lot more slides, and showing you um, the situation before and after the typhoon and all that sort of thing. So we see that at the local scale, you can have a, a large difference between a degraded situation and a forested situation. But the general thinking is that, okay, you can have these big effects locally uh, um, because of differences in land use, but at the larger scale, much of this will disappear simply because we'll have different land uses across the landscape and also um, rain will fall here but not there and so the net effect as you move down will become less and less. And that's the general paradigm, if you like. But if you have a situation um, where there's rain everywhere across um, over a very large area, like here, for instance, the Ganges, Brahmaputra area, where most of the rain falls in a period of three to four months, and so the whole area wets up, and then during the second part of the um, half of the monsoon, all of this rain falls on an already wetted area, you can have mega events over very large areas. So under those conditions, um, it's the, rain, the size of the rainfall field that determines it. But mostly we'll see that um, because of spatial difference in rainfall and in land use, you'll see that the local effects will peter out as you, as you go downstream. But the interesting thing is that if you have, and again, I come back to the degradation thing, if you have large-scale urbanization and industrialization, as you have, in, uh, for instance, in, in Indonesia, in West Java, where large areas of rice fields have been converted to cities and um, industry, you'll see that these peak flows, these highest flows, will increase, uh, again, even more compared to the the previous situation. So again, we're looking here at uh, maximum flows as a function of return period. And the greater the return period, the more extreme the event. And so you'll see that um, before the conversion of these rice fields that used to buffer the, uh, the rainfall, uh, before conversion to um, cities and, and, and industry, you'll see that there was a sort of a moderate increase with the uh, return period. But afterwards, again, you'll see that the line is steeper than, um, than before. Again, the same as we found for these smaller catchments. So again, large-scale degradation of the surface is having an effect also at the large scale and not just at the local scale. Likewise, if you have widespread soil degradation in the form of crusting and those kind of things, um, there is increasing evidence that um, wet season flows are on the increase over time as the degradation proceeds. So um, also at the 1,000 square kilometer scale, so not just at the small catchment scale. So in my view, uh, the evidence is, is overwhelming once you look for it, that soil degradation in all its forms is having an effect 
at um, all sorts of scales. And so my conclusion would be that we should be careful to apply the findings derived from, let's say, non-degraded paired catchment experiments, mostly located in the temperate zone anyway, um, to apply those findings to a real-world situation where widespread soil degradation may be uh, really um, important. So moving to water yield and forests, it is obvious that um, the discrepancy is between the scientists on the one hand stating that trees use a lot of water, whereas the local people um, typically believe that the more trees we plant, the more water we'll have. So there you have the debate in a nutshell. Now what does have science have to say? Uh, we all know that if we stand underneath the tree, we may um, stay dry for a longer time than uh, if we're standing in the open. Likewise, if we have a long dry period, the trees remain green because they have deeper root system capable of exploiting a deeper uh, layer of soil, whereas the shallower rooted grass and crops uh, turn brown. And so it doesn't come as a surprise that trees and forests use more water than grass and crops. And these general relationships uh, show this, that forests use indeed more water than shorter crops across the rainfall spectrum. So the upshot is that if we remove forest, we'll have more uh, stream flow. So this graph here shows the extra amount of stream flow that is uh, produced if we remove uh, a part of the uh, vegetation cover. And so the more forest we remove, the more water is produced um, according to these uh, experiments. At the same time, if we clear the forest completely, you'll see that there's a tremendous range in increase in in stream flow, some from 100 to more than 800 millimeters a year. So different places give different results. If you plot those 100% clearing extra stream flow to rainfall, you'll see that there is a, a slight positive relationship, but it's not very strong. We also see that for the same amount of rainfall, you can have vastly different amounts of extra stream flow. So it's not just a matter of, you know, removing the vegetation and reducing the vegetation water use and therefore having more stream flow, but it also has to do with what we're doing to the soil. Again, compaction and those kind of things. So you might as well say that um, it depends really on what we do to the landscape. So there's a lot of talk about fo post-forest land use being detrimental and, and having very bad effects, but when we're con Comparing these two situations, for instance, here uh, a picture from Indonesia where we find very few trees in the landscape, just like in this heavily degraded landscape in Nepal. In both cases, there's hardly any tree to be seen, but in terms of hydrological functioning, there's a vast difference in um, what we can expect. On the left-hand side, everything is more or less under control. Uh, streams keep flowing. Whereas in the Nepali case, um, we, we have a, a desperate situation. So it's not just a matter of having trees or not. It's also what you do to the hill slopes and to the, to the landscape. Now, perhaps there may be one um, exception, and that relates to montane cloud forests. Um, as you move up to higher elevations, you typically get into uh, the cloud belt, under those conditions, if there's enough wind, there's these clouds drifting in, they hit the vegetation and it starts dripping. And in this way, they, um, let's say, they have a, an extra source of water entering the ecosystem. You cannot measure it with the, uh, a rain gauge, hence it's kind of hidden, hence we um, refer to it often as occult precipitation. So you get a lot of extra input um, at the same time because of the presence of all these clouds and fog, uh, evaporation is reduced, and therefore these cloud forests produce a lot of extra stream flow for a given amount of rainfall relative to other types of forests. Now, in the extended presentation, there's a whole bunch of uh, 
slides on these cloud forests and different situations. But basically, some people think that if you cut cloud forests, you will not increase stream flow, but rather reduce it because you uh, are losing this extra input of occult precipitation. And I've been involved in a number of cloud forest projects, and in some cases, uh, there was indeed a reduction in stream flow, particularly in very windy places where occult precipitation may be very high, but in other places where wind speeds are low and fault capture is low, um, they just behave like any other forest. So I refer to the general presentation uh, for that. I'm turning to the uh, last item that I'd like to discuss, and perhaps the most important one in terms of usefulness of the water, is the relationship between forests and, and base flow. And even though some people make a whole career out of storm flow, like Jeff, um, I would argue that base flows are far more important because um, you, know, you can use the water, and storm flow is no use, it's just a nuisance. But um, you can use it for hydropower um, generation, of course, irrigation, domestic use, uh, fisheries, navigation, all this kind of thing. So base flow is really important to people um, in the field or on the ground. And the interesting thing is that if you compare stream flow um, throughout the year as a function of presence or absence of forest, and for a situation in which the soil is not deteriorated by deforestation, you'll see that throughout the year, the deforested case will carry more water. And so you may wonder about the validity of that spawned concept. Uh, because if you have a, a non-forest situation and you have more water, then what, what use is that forest spawned concept? At the same time, you might argue that in many cases, the soil is becoming disturbed somehow by the deforestation. Uh, if we're talking about... Um, Timber harvesting, usually done by heavy machinery, compacting the soil and all, um, followed by burning of the uh, logging debris or clearing the land for agriculture or whatever. And then we can have years of agriculture without proper uh, soil management. That, of course, um, may reduce the soil hydrological functioning. So I would argue perhaps soil degradation somehow is the rule rather than the exception. So our Experiments rarely um, experience that. On the other hand, if you look at the situation where there is advanced soil degradation, we typically get a situation where during the wet season, and again we're looking here at stream flow throughout the year, but during the wet season, we'll have a lot of extra uh, runoff coming out of the um, landscape that does not infiltrate into the soil, therefore does not recharge the groundwater or feed springs, and therefore during the subsequent dry season we'll have less flow than before. In other words, the forest sponge effect is, is lost. And so you cannot blame the farmers that say that during the forested period we had more stream flow than we have now. Maybe not on an annual basis, but definitely during the dry season. And Unfortunately, in the literature, with its short uh, funding time spans and, and all that, the experiments do not run long enough for the uh, big degradation to, to kick in. But there are a couple of um, long-term uh, observations for, for large catchments that do show um, an increase in stream flow over decades, sometimes even uh, despite gradually diminishing rainfall. So that means that Despite the fact that um, there is less rainfall, you have more stream flow because of you know, removal of vegetation, gradual deterioration of soil conditions. Under those conditions, you'll see that even though the stream flow is increasing over time, um, you'll see that most of that increase happens during the wet season. And again, um, you have too much during a time of year when you have enough water anyway, but at the same time you'll see that during the lean season, during the dry season, the flows will uh, go down, and therefore um, your problem will increase. And it's quite ironical that um, 
in one of the wettest places on earth, like Cherrapunji in uh, Meghalaya, northeastern India, they have to bring in tanker trucks to bridge the dry season water uh, uh, necessity, or needs rather, um, because even though this place receives something like 12 meters of rain a year, um, the ecosystem is so disturbed that it can no longer retain that water, and therefore the tanker trucks have to be brought in. So in tropical ecohydrology, I would argue that a key question is, can we um, boost these base flows again? Uh, well, we, when we have degradation, reduced dry season flows, can we uh, improve that situation? And how should we do that? Should we just allow nature to take its course, allow natural regeneration, or should we actively plant trees? And if so, what sort of trees? Those are the questions. And so, um, even though all the emphasis is on changing the land use, we shouldn't forget that there, underneath that vegetation, there is also a soil, and there is also rock types, each with its thickness and, and characteristics that also govern the hydrological functioning. So it's not just about trees or non-trees, it's also about what's uh, found underneath. So just keep that in mind. Now, without going into detail as to the effects of uh, natural regrowth, there's an interesting phenomenon going on in uh, quite a few mountainous areas in, uh, in Latin America, as well as in New Zealand and, and the Himalayas, where people are moving towards the cities and abandoning um, steep slopes in the mountains. And as this happens, also in the Mediterranean, you see that the forest is coming back. Um, we don't know too much about um, the hydrological impacts, but what we do know is that these secondary forests that are growing very rapidly to regain biomass and to build up biomass, um, that they're using a lot more water than the old growth equilibrium forests. Um, however, we don't know for how long uh, that lasts. So what we do know is that these regenerating forests use a lot more water than old growth forests, and for how long we simply don't know. So that's a major area for future research. The other thing is that uh, lots of places in the tropics are being plagued by exotic invaders. And one of the most notorious ones is uh, Myconia, also referred to as the, um, the green cancer throughout the Pacific. And again, entire ecosystems are being taken over by these exotic invaders. I mean, know oh, very little about the, um, the impacts on the um, hydrology. And there's a couple of more slides in the presentation. But apart from natural regeneration and these exotic invaders, um, most of our uh, activity relates to planting trees. And again, we have seen this diagram before showing that forests use more water than non-forest. And so as a result, um, the horizontal line here is the, is the reference. We introduce trees in, um, let's say, a grass landscape or a crop uh, landscape, and we introduce trees. And as the trees mature, grow older, we'll see that the amount of stream flow decreases over time. And so, in other words, um, these trees use more water than the grassland, and therefore we lose water. That's what science says. And there's no denying that um, effect, as it's demonstrated by numerous catchment experiments. At the same time, we should notice that only three out of 65 catchment experiments are located in the tropics, and none of these catchments are experiencing any form of soil degradation. So in other words, if you plant trees, the only effect you'll measure is the higher water use of the trees, but you won't be measuring any effect on the soil. Uh, any improvement. If some of these catchments would have been very degraded and you introduce trees and improve the soil, then you would have a, an extra effect, not just the water use effect. And so, um, in the final part of my talk, I'd like to explore these two processes a little further. Um, on the one hand, most of you uh, will understand this despite the Chinese signs, I guess, but on the one hand, you can have a, a forested situation 
where we have high evaporation, high water use, but also high infiltration, and therefore very little lateral losses of water. On the other extreme, we can have a very degraded hillside with very low water use by the vegetation, because there is, isn't there much vegetation. But also, the, uh, the uh, infiltration of the soil, uh, the capacity of the soil is really low, and so we'll have lots of lateral losses. So I would say it's the balance between these two processes, or rather the change in these two processes, that determines whether stream fuel will go up or down um, if you're introducing trees. And so you can really ask yourself, having seen that you know, introducing trees causes the streams to, to dry up, whether it's possible to boost these low flows planting trees. Um, and the answer, I would say, is that if the extra water use of the introduced trees can be compensated by soil improvement, in other words, extra infiltration, then you have a chance of you know, boosting your low flows. But that requires uh, a rebuilding of the infiltration capacity. And that only happens over a, a fairly long time. You need at least 10, uh, 10 years, if not 20 years, of uninterrupted soil recovery for the surface infiltration capacity to, to build up again. And of course, if you have another disturbance in the form of fire or grazing or those, those kind of things, you will not realize that, that improvement in uh, infiltration capacity. So to sum up the literature, I've plotted as a function of rainfall the increases in infiltrated water um, known from the literature. So these various crosses are various studies across the tropics where people have compared the amount of water infiltrating into the soil um, under degraded conditions and after introducing trees. But none of these studies have also measured the associated water use of the new vegetation. So to approximate that, I used these same two curves that we've seen before, subtracted one from the other to um, simulate, if you like, or approximate the water use of the introduced trees. So the blue line is the amount of water that you lose by introducing trees. And then we can compare the position of the infiltration points relative to the blue line. So, for instance, if some of these points are on the line, it means that all of the extra infiltration is used up again in evaporation, whereas those points above the line are indicative of, you know, improved situation. You have more infiltration than you lose by evaporation. And so the next question is, maybe in individual places we can have this sort of uh, result, but where in the world can we actually expect um, you know, the best results if we introduce trees? So Jorge Peña Arancibia, a former um, PhD student of mine uh, in uh, King's College, he uh, went to look for uh, a global, let's say, identification of what you might call bright spots or hot spots of positive results. And without going into details, he used the curve number method to estimate the storm flow under current conditions and under a hypothetical reforested scenario. And I'll skip this one uh, for now. So we used the pantropical soil map to classify the soil types hydrologically, combined it with the land surface condition to come up with a, a map of these curve numbers which are basically used in a simple formula to compute the storm runoff, that is the, you know, the uh, runoff response to rainfall. If you then combine that with a long-term rainfall data set, you can work out the storm flow production under current degraded conditions and also under a hypothetical uh, reforestation condition. And the result is a, a map like this uh, for a, a pantropical situation the darker the color, the greater the reduction 
in storm flow. So some areas will experience greater reduction in storm flow, hence greater infiltration than others. If you then look at the corresponding water loss by evaporation, again, you can model that across the tropics, and again, you'll see darker spots um, losing more water by evaporation than others. Then you overlay the two for the net effect, and I'm not showing the pantropical effect or map, but here in Southeast Asia, uh, you can see all sorts of hot spots, like here in uh, Northeast India or Sumatra, South China, parts of the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, where there, at least on the basis of this very relatively simple analysis, you can expect a positive effect of introducing trees in uh, degraded areas. Now you may wonder, um, you know, what's this model worth? Is there any uh, empirical evidence for this sort of um, finding? And you'll see that here in um, East Asia, there is a lot of orange and red in this soil vulnerability map. And so these might be areas where we might have a positive response. And indeed, there's a couple of recent experiments that are you know, published in the marginal literature, perhaps, including one in uh, South Korea, where an area was um, really um, denuded in the 1970s because of the previous war and everything. Uh, it was reforested and monitored over time for more than 30 years. And what we see is that some 10, 15 years after reforestation, you still see some bare spots, but 20 years later, or after that, it's even uh, fully grown. But more interestingly, these people have looked at the stream flow throughout these 30, 35 years, and lo and behold, under the original denuded conditions, the stream would flow for about three months a year and be dry in the rest of the year. But as the vegetation matured, you'll see that after, typically after 15, 20 years, that st the stream started flowing for a longer time. And that exactly matches that curve that I showed earlier of the gradual improvement of the soil infiltration. And now, after 35 years, um, essentially, the stream has become perennial. So it's a telling example that um, um, improving the soil may help to bring back the, um, the stream flow. Now, the rainfall also increased a little, but not enough. Likewise, in, in the south of China, over a very large area of uh, denuded red soils. Pine trees were planted over at least 10,000 square kilometers. And again, despite very large fluctuations over time, um, going over from a period of about 20% um, forest to more than 60, almost 60% forest, there was a, a positive trend that was significant in dry season flows. So again, uh, we have an example that you know, large-scale reforestation of very degraded areas may actually improve the flows. And last but not least, our own experiment in the, uh, in the Philippines, um, where the tribal area, uh, people that we work with, claim that after seven years after their arrival and they started planting trees, their stream became perennial. It was a bit difficult to work with them in the beginning because they said, why would I... Uh, have research on my site because I have the flow in front of me. Uh, the evidence is there already. And then I said, well, are you so sure that it's not nothing to do with increased rainfall? Is it really the trees that you planted? And they said, okay, uh, build your weirs, install your rain gauges, and let's have a look. So um, just before um, the mega typhoon hit uh, Tacloban City last year, we visited the uh, meteorological office and uh, found the um, rainfall data. After that, the whole building was wiped out by the, uh, by the flood. But at least we, we, we have these data. And we'll see that over the years, there's a gradual increase in, uh, in rainfall. So here is where the reforestation started. And seven years later, the stream became perennial uh, during a cluster of years where we had well above average rainfall. And likewise, and I'm nearly uh, at the end of my story, the number of months with low rainfall uh, 
was actually decreasing throughout that period. So we cannot rule out an effect of um, you know, increasing rainfall during this period. At the same time, we also demonstrated that you know, there's a greater intake of rainfall under these reforested conditions. And in a few weeks from now, I, I expect we'll be able to answer that question whether the infiltration was enough to compensate the higher water use of these trees. So that's a work in progress. But it, it might be the third example from Southeast Asia where um, reforesting degraded land actually um, <coughs> produced a positive result. So summarizing, um, you could argue that you know, having a full forest cover um, is the best guarantee for stable base flows. In theory, it could also be grassland or cropland, but then under the proviso that you know, it needs to be really well managed, and you don't see that too often in, in, in practice. We also seen that surface degradation, soil degradation, is widespread and therefore uh, important, yet we don't have too much evidence in our um, regular experiments to actually document it. So that is a whole lot of work to be done. We also see that planting trees typically reduces stream flow um, throughout the year unless we have a situation where the soil capacity is um, improved enough. We also seen through our global analysis that there might be hot spots across the tropics where we can have positive um, effects um, under high rainfall conditions and in really degraded uh, areas. But there's still room for far more hill slope and, and small catchment and plant physiological experimentation. And as I said earlier, we know fairly little about natural regrowth relative to exotic invaders or, um, or planted trees. So there's a whole lot of work to be done. So summarizing, um, we know a lot more than before. And we need to communicate that sort of knowledge um, that we are generating to practitioners, to local people, um, local communities, etc. But a key point is that as long as the scientists among themselves cannot agree as to what the effect is of forests on hydrology, um, confusion and therefore policies will remain, uh, you know, <coughs> confused and contradictory. So thank you very much for your uh, patience. I'm honoring my two heroes here, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Sherlock MacDonald. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. All right, thanks very much. Time for a few questions. And Natalie has a microphone and we'll be run racing it to you so we can have the questions recorded as well. Howard. Well, it's a really enjoyable talk. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. An observation and then a question. Uh, so the observation is, um, uh, in my last few years in the UK, we were looking at effects of uh, agricultural intensification, which compacted uh, hill slopes. And then we were looking at planting um, tree buffer strips um, to improve uh, the soil. And actually, we got very rapid improvements in um, soil hydraulic properties within two to three years, an order of magnitude improvements. So maybe your 10 years that you mentioned was, was a little pessimistic. Um, I, anyway. I thought it was actually rather optimistic. <coughs> uh, <coughs> I suppose it, it depends on the, uh, the level of disturbance of the soil. And uh, what we also see, in fact, there is a, lot of, a number of slides in the extended uh, presentation showing that um, throughout forest development, um, but also coupled to intensive use of these uh, forests by the local people, the uh, hydrological functioning actually went down instead of up as the forest matured. So it's, it's very much a matter of, um, like in your UK forest, the, these forests are not used by local people. The people are not grazing their cows in there. They're not um, collecting the litter and all these kind of things. So these tropical forests are, are a bit different in, in that sense. I had a question about what is a tree. Um, uh, Did you say what is a tree? Well, given that um, y you, didn't, you didn't talk about, I think in your introductory remarks um, you, you mentioned it, but um, 
it's a question about the difference between tree species. Yeah. So in the boreal forest here, um, I don't think we've got Alan Barr in the audience, but um, we, we have um, uh, instrumented sites with different tree species, and, and the water balance is quite um, balanced, finely balanced between precipitate evaporation. So there are quite significant differences between yeah. species. Um, and then I noticed you had a, a picture of Ian Calder, um, and the one, of the things stuff one. Yeah. one of the things I remember him yeah. for was uh, working on introducing eucalypts into southern India yeah. and, and the fact that introducing an exotic species was then actually mining quite deep soil moisture. Yeah. So you, you talked about trees rather generically. Could you comment perhaps on some of the importance of interspecies differences? Yeah, yeah well, in the interest of time, I deleted a few slides on that. Um, so it's good you picked that up. Um, incidentally, uh, what Ian did find in, in the eucalypt work in South India was that the natural vegetation used as much water as did the uh, eucalypts. And so uh, the same thing as John Roberts found for uh, European forests, that in the end it doesn't matter whether you have coniferous species or, or broadleaf species, in the end they use as much water uh, uh, altogether. Um, apparently it sort of balances out. And the same with the eucalypts under these very seasonal conditions, um, if soil moisture is depleted sufficiently, then even a eucalypt will have to shut down. And only if it has access to the groundwater, like in riparian zones and, and stuff, um, will they continue pumping. But so would, do, um, would the, the natural shola forests in, in that area. So that didn't make uh, much difference. Um, the other thing is that between pines or eucalypts, there, there is a bit of a, a difference in timing in, in the sense that eucalypts reach their maximum water use after, say, five to seven years, whereas in the case of pines, it takes at least 10, 15 years, or even 20 years after which it starts to decline again. So there is some difference in terms of timing, wh when they reach that maximum level. But interestingly, these maximum levels are very similar for evergreen species in the tropics. The only thing is if, if you go to, uh, say, species like teak or jimalina that lose their leaves during the dry season, those have an overall water use that is a little less than the evergreen species. But um, they have as a drawback, um, often th there's a lot of erosion underneath these species. So it's a, it's a trade-off. They use a little less water, particularly during the dry season because their leaves are down. But at the same time, um, they're, they're poorer at infiltration building, so they're not to be recommended in that respect. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? One thing I was wondering about was the boosting of base flows, how geology <laughs> factors into that. So we had catchments in Oregon where in the, in the Cascades, the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, you could have the wettest winter on record or the driest winter on record in this highly seasonal Mediterranean climate, meaning long, dry summer period, yeah. and the end of the summer base flows were always, this, always the same. But then you go to area with more permeable geology, and of course you have m much more memory of uh, precipitation input past. And I'm wondering how that might play out in the boosting of base flows. It seems like you'd really be at the mercy of the kind of hydrogeological piece of the, the equation if, you, in fact, you can get the water kind of past the rooting zone, yeah. uh, perhaps in a season when maybe you're getting a lot of rain input where there's not so much transpiration output. or Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's true. And, and one of the slides that I showed was that it's not just about the trees you, you choose, but also about the soil thickness and, and the rock type underneath. Um, so that is a valid point. On the other hand, uh, the geology doesn't change. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do see is that if you have a very shallow soil, you may be able to boost your infiltration capacity, but then it would not be of much, much help because that soil can only contain that much water and any extra water will have to run off anyway. So I, I would think that the, the greatest improvements you may expect is in the case where you have sufficiently deep soil, even regardless of geology underneath that, um, or rotten rock for that matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least a, a depth capable of storing water. Uh, so it, it's true, you, you do need some uh, minimum depth to store that water to, to have a positive uh, right. 
uh, overall effect. Right. Yeah. I'm looking for questions from uh, our simulcast members. I'm not checking my uh, text messages here. Um, students in class, maybe you have a question that you brought to class this morning relating to the paper that perhaps links to the talk you might want to uh, pose. Yes. You just pass it to Graham. Yeah. Oh. Uh, regarding to the paper which I read earlier yesterday was um, <coughs> the reforest uh, he did research on is like just the mano single space right for mm -hmm. the pie tree and uh, I wonder because the whole ecosystem is combined by many different components uh, there, there should be more some animals or some bacteria mm -hmm. or anything like that. I wonder, is that because of that's a single, that's a, like mano single species? Yeah, mm -hmm. not really a system. I wonder if, if we can get some improved on that reforest yeah. and make it more mature or more diverse. Yeah, adding more components yeah. in it is the results would be different. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Because it's kind of compared. We know for sure the artificial forest can be compared with uh, the original forest or natural forest at all, but if we do, if we do it more close, yeah. make it looks l looks more close to the natural forest. Yeah. If the result could be different. Yeah, it's a very good point. And uh, uh, indeed, there there is an experiment in uh, Guangdong in in southern China, mm -hmm. where where they use single species reforestation in, in this particular case eucalypt but also mixed plantations, including uh, leg leguminous species like acacias and so on, and also in uh, eastern Australia. And it really shows that where you have mixed species, the, the fast-growing ones plus the ones that fix the nitrogen, um, you not only um, enhance the productivity of the other species, but also improve the soil faster. So particularly these nitrogen fixers um, are key to, to restoration. And even though you don't get uh, a multi-species natural forest back so easily, um, it, it does make a difference. But at the same time, because of that enhanced productivity, you also see that the water use of that mixed forest will be higher compared to the single species. And so you lose more water temporarily uh, until perhaps, I think, but no one has uh, looked at this long enough, there is a balance again, you know, where the soil has improved such that it kind of compensates again for the higher water use of these trees. But you're right that diversity is, is key to uh, getting a faster ecosystem uh, development. Yeah. Good. Ali. Mr. Ali, yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, this inter interesting uh, presentation. Just uh, have a quick question about the uh, effect of a canopy. In, uh, in the analysis you've done and uh, your measurement and comparing between grassland and forest, uh, don't you think uh, considering the canopy uh, might also might be useful because we have evapotrans evaporation from the canopy, not just from the soil, and we have interception by canopy, mm -hmm. and all these factors uh, in addition to, for example, uh, infiltration and uh, rate of uh, rainfall might be uh, useful and interesting to be compared uh, when we are comparing grassland and uh, forest and effect of, for example, uh, reforestation. When we are considering this effect, don't you think a canopy effect also might be important here? It, it's included already. Well, when, when, when we're talking to total of, of total water use, that includes these three components. You know, the wet canopy evaporation or rainfall interception, the dry canopy evaporation or soil water uh -huh. uptake, 
as well as for a floor evaporation. So those three components, including the two canopy components of evaporation, are already included in the, in the uh, equation. So when I'm referring to water use, that's the total. That's including the net, the net flow on the, uh, on the ground surface. No, it's just referring to the total water loss. But okay. you, you could also look at it fr you know, through a narrower perspective, if you like, that the amount of water reaching the soil is what's dripping from the canopy and running uh, down the stems. That's your input to the soil. And then the only loss is, on the one hand, drainage, and on the other hand, any overland flows plus the transpiration again. But that's... Um, making things a bit more complicated. Yeah, so don't you think it can be uh, one of the negative effects of uh, reforestation? What exactly? Um, the effect of canopy, because it's reducing the net water that uh, uh, drips on the ground surface. The but that's, that's part of total ET. As I explained in the beginning when I showed this, this drawing of the tree, um, I said, well, Rainfall interception is, is one part of evaporation uh -huh. that's higher in the case of trees relative to non-trees, plus the deeper root system. Mm -hmm. And so these two things together create this higher overall water use of trees compared to non-trees. So that is a drawback, perhaps. And that's what people have stressed all along, that you know, if you plant trees, you'll lose water. That's true in itself. I mean, the facts are there. But at the same time, these trees also have a positive effect on the soils. Yes. And if you look at annual balances, then one may win over the other. But if you look at the seasonal uh, course, then this infiltration may turn the balance around and you'll have more flow during the time of year when you need it most. That was the point I was trying to make. That's good. Thank you. Okay, well, we're just uh, after five o'clock, so I think we'll draw it to an end. Uh, Willamine, we're going to Louis' pub today. Is that the plan? So we're the loft, Louis' loft, yes. So rather than uh, Alexander's, for those that want to join us for a, a beverage after this talk, we're going to Louis' loft uh, here on campus. Most of you know where that is. But uh, please join with me in thanking uh, Sam Forno for a really interesting talk. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.